putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. I talked about uh, Steve Bannon earlier in the broadcast. By the way, this is Kevin Jackson. You're listening to the Kevin Jackson Show. And there was an article written about him, you know, because he obviously left the administration and had gone back to Breitbart. And 60 Minutes covered it. And as I said, we we, uh, covered a couple of things that he said that I think are important. So go back to the podcast and listen if you didn't hear it. But they write in this article, two days after he ceased to be President Trump's chief strategist, Bannon explained why he had welcomed the economist to his house on Capitol Hill for a chat. You're the enemy, he said, adding disdainfully, you support a radical idea, free trade. I mean it. It's a that's a radical idea. As he returned to his former job running Breitbart News, a bomb throwing right wing website, Mr. Bannon wants to make clear that he still loves a scrap. In the White House, I had influence, he said several times during a long discussion at Breitbart. I had power. Among the particular opponents he has in his sights, Mr. Bannon seated in a dining room decorated with Christian iconography and political mementos our congressional Republicans, Mitch McConnell, I'm going to light him up, China, let's go screw up one belt, one road, I don't even know what that means, and the elites in Silicon Valley and Wall Street, they're a bunch of globalists who have forgotten their fellow Americans. Despite his departure, voluntarily, he insists, though his resignation is reported to have been demanded of him, Bannon says he will never attack his former boss. Yet Breitbart will caution Mr. Trump to stick to the populist nationalist course Bannon charted. We will never turn on him, but we are never going to let him take a decision that hurts him. The website offered an early taste of this in its disparaging coverage of Mr. Trump's flip-flop decision to send more American troops to Afghanistan, which was announced on August 21st, and Bannon strongly opposes, and they referenced the article. The reason why I bring this up is a couple reasons. It's a nice segue into Trump's relationship with Bannon, as well as what Trump recently did with the Republican establishment. And if there's anything I can tell you about Bannon, having met him and known him, Bannon's not your typical conservative. And I will give him credit. He thinks differently about politics than most people. Now, we had a run in over black issues and I. Well, I was on the radio with him. I was like, you know, he's challenging me on certain things. And I'm, I have essentially said, look, Steve, no offense. You're out of your wheelhouse here, dude. You don't know enough about black folks and what goes on in our neighborhoods to say grace over. But if you want to play devil's advocate, because he was almost coming off like a leftist. Well, Kevin, you got to understand this is about black neighborhoods. I, go, I don't have to understand anything about black neighborhoods. I know all about black neighborhoods. I mean, you know, just because I put a suit and tie on and go on Fox, You know, as as they say, don't let the smooth taste fool you. I know exactly what happens in black neighborhoods. I know about crime. I know about, there's nothing you're going to tell me that's going to, I'm going to go, whoa, that happened in a black neighborhood? Seriously? I know one when I see one because I doggone grew up in them and I visited many and many of my friends still live in black neighborhoods. But I did appreciate you know, the fact that he's willing to push back, that's fine. Challenge my, you know, my question me, make sure I'm legit. But I will tell you his, as much as, you know, that he was out of his wheelhouse there, but when he's in his wheelhouse, the guy is a shrewd operator. He really is. Now with respect to Afghanistan and troops, Bannon doesn't know enough about that to, to understand why Trump made the decision. This is where I I differ with people arguing over, do we send troops here? Do we do? How do we fight this? You don't have a fraction of the information that Donald Trump gets. And not only does Donald Trump get this information, he's then got to discern, as we know, is it a swamp creature bringing it or what do I need to do? If he made the decision that we needed to send more troops, send more troops. The proof is in the outcome. As I said earlier in the broadcast, and I've said for the past couple of weeks, you haven't heard much from ISIS. ISIS bomb. What was the last place they bombed? Like Brussels? Or no, no, it was uh, Brit. Was it Britain? The two attacks in Britain. We. I don't remember, and you may not either. 
But here's the deal. There was some civilized country that they bombed, and we haven't heard anything since. They were bombing people. They were doing lone, what they call lone wolf attacks practically daily. I'm talking about, forget in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. We know they're fighting there. I'm talking about in civilized countries. Brussels, you know, Stad, whatever, Nice, areas of Germany. They they were attacking people, Britain, you know, on the bridge, London Bridge, and so on and so forth. You haven't heard a thing. Now, I'm not telling you we've won. I'm, I'm certainly not going to be naive, but I'll tell you this. Whatever Trump did, it, it put a, a ceasefire, if you will, on him. And then when I, I did a little bit of research... And I found out, oh, wow, he's got them on the run. They just lost this city. The Iraqi army just took over such and such. And you're going, wow, why aren't we hearing this? So, look, Bannon needs to stay in his wheelhouse. Now, what did Trump do? Trump says, screw the Republican establishment. And we've been debating this internally I'm talking about as conservatives going was it a good thing or a bad thing and of course I, you can almost tell the never Trumpers because immediately they hated it they hated that he increased the debt ceiling had to do it I, the, the sad part is you have to do it because he hasn't had enough time to get into the budget to continue to cut it but we didn't get into the trillion dollars that we've been getting into lately so anyway he increased the debt ceiling so he could fund relief for Hurricane Harvey. There was no money left in FEMA. So you either let a, the state of Texas suffer or you do it. The Democrats go, we had him over the barrel. Fine. You think you had him over the barrel. And I don't know all the different nuances of what happened there, but here's what I'll tell you, and I said it before. If I trusted somebody to get us the best deal and to do the right thing for the time, it's Donald Trump. Would you ever have trusted if they told you a deal was done by Barack Obama? Would you trust it? It could be the identical deal. And this is one of these areas where I have to admit, you know, it's a contradiction because if Barack Obama had you know, raised the debt ceiling to fund Hurricane Katrina or what I mean, Hurricane Harvey, I would have been a little skeptical. Now, that said, once I understand the details, I would probably go, look, the debt ceiling. The sad part is we are having to raise it because of the way we do business. Now, the problem with Obama, he's going to keep spending. Trump isn't. Would he need to fund Hurricane Harvey if FEMA's broke? Yes, he would. I'd have no problem with that. And I don't know all the other concessions. But what I can tell you unequivocally is I know Donald Trump is a spendthrift. That's number one. And I also know I trust his decisions because I have a record to look at. Washington Times says President Trump's not concerned that he angered some Capitol Hill Republicans by striking a deal with the Democrats to quickly pass an emergency disaster relief. He says it was important to break the gridlock in Congress. The biggest message is we are a lot less focused on what makes Congress happy and instead on what makes Americans bigger, I'm sorry, better and stronger, said uh, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. He's going to continue working with whoever is interested in moving the ball forward to help the American people. They write this. Mr. Trump blindsided Republican leaders and riled conservative lawmakers with the deal that tied a short-term increase in the debt limit and spending to keep government open until mid-December with an emergency disaster relief. Now, we all hate that the debt ceiling continues to go up. We hate that. But that's temporary. The long-term impact of Donald Trump is he will cut the budget. Look, guys, every department that this guy, the way he put a, a leader, every one of them's cut their, they've cut their teams. Donald Trump's cut the VA, what, 5,000 or 50, it was like 15,400 people, if I'm not mistaken. It's 15,000 from the VA. No, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. He, he cut 500 jobs in the VA. 15,000 throughout the Fed. But it's a lot of jobs. And it's not done. Every department is being told to phase out. Start 
going smaller. I want to see the report when it's done. How big is government under Trump? It will be smaller, folks. So this is a if that's the worst of their of the concessions that he makes, God, that would be nothing in comparison to what we've been known to, you know, what we've become accustomed to. So what are these people talking about? Screw the Republican establishment. That's what we said when we elected this guy. Feel good about this, folks. These are the signs of the time. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.